Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. And this is the Standing With Stones Megalithic Podcast. This podcast is only made possible by monthly donations from our listeners who've supported us through Patreon.com. You can become one of our patrons for as little as a dollar a month by visiting patreon.com slash standingwithstones. And welcome to the fifth Standing With Stones monthly podcast. Of course, we've got loads of new stuff to talk about and a couple of real surprises in the news. Yeah, not to mention your own little excursion this month. My little excursion? Oh yes, indeed. I've been um, down in Cornwall on holiday ostensibly, but also found myself filming at some of the wonderful sites down there and with the drone as well. So I've been uh, getting some very unusual views of various locations for you. Uh, Some of it, uh, when I finish the editing, will be freely available to view on our website, um, but that's after it's been exclusively available to our patrons on patreon.com forward slash standing with stones. So as ever, to begin with, we're going to um, push back a boundary. How are you going to do this? um, How are you going to do that this month, Rupert? (laughs) Well, you know, this one's a little bit different. Um, It's always a little bit different. You always say... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we do try. We do try. Keep it yeah, moving. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, um, I'm so glad. <laughs> well, archaeologists in Mongolia, of all places, we do like to get about, um, mm. they've discovered the oldest known evidence for veterinary dentistry. You do find them, don't you? Yeah, hey, veterinary dentistry. It, it's, uh, it's quite something. This. Now, the deer stone culture the Kirigsur culture, uh, so named because of their beautiful carvings of, believe it or not, deer. (laughs) And their impressive stone mounds called Kirigsurs. Um, They were around during the Bronze Age, mid to late, so 1300 to 700 BC. And they're most noted for their extraordinary horse burials. And there's a lot of debate about the cultural relationship with horses, you know, whether the animals were food, beasts of burden, or, you know, they were clearly being ridden. Um, but uh, but as I said, the burials are ritualised and contain just the horses' heads, mm-hmm. usually facing east, sometimes with a few vertebrae, and the animals' hooves, right? Now, the Burial sites vary enormously in size, uh, uh, and they vary from just a few individuals, so just a few horses at a site, mm-hmm. but they go up to, you know, there are dozens or even hundreds of horses, and at the extreme end of the scale, there is even one site called Urt Bugalin, if that's not an appalling pronunciation. It probably is. Uh, where archaeologists have <laughs> uncovered the remains of nearly, wait for it, 1,700 individual horses. That's ridiculous. It's insane. That's ridiculous. It, it is, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, that's a ridiculous number. I, <laughs> all buried at the same time or over a period of time? I, well, yeah, I don't know. That that amount of research has, uh, you know, they, they haven't, um, uh, you know, gone through and dated uh, every, you know, yeah, every yeah, skull, sure, every sure. hoof, which, you know, I dare say, uh, well, that, all that work is still, I dare say, ongoing. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, I'm still digre- I'm digressing. In that well, well, yeah, when but they the, were, the thing is a- to remember when we're talking about Mongolia, the, the horse culture is still well and truly embedded there. I mean... Absolutely. The, the, I, I think I saw a photograph um, uh, on, uh, online. You're talking about uh, horse dentistry. I saw a photograph yeah. of... Uh, a young boy performing dentistry on his one of his foals. It's right now. It's something it's, full color. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, and and in actual fact, the technique that they were using right back then is not a whole lot different from modern 
horse dentistry. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. It's, it, it's, so it's something that has been going for a, a very long time. It was, it's an extraordinary thing. And I, I really, I can't get over the fact that there's that one burial with 1,700 horses. No, that, it doesn't that's, seem um, possible. That's absolutely but, crazy. So that's, I mean, 1,700, it, that's pushing back a boundary, isn't it, for a number of... It's, uh, that's yeah. pushing back, um, yes, but, yes, but, another But you're talking it's, about the uh, the date, obviously, of the... Uh, the I'm talking about the, the date of dentistry as such. So, uh, you know, it's quite significant to show that degree of, well, can we call it husbandry? Is that the right word in this yeah, context? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, looking after animals to to that extent. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a fascinating one. Actually. So, what's our first news item this month, Mike? Well, it would be hard to avoid all the stuff that's been going on with the latest discoveries in Ireland, really. I mean, at, at yeah. the risk of, um, you know, telling you about things you already know, because uh, the mainstream media have been all over the stuff that uh, um, uh, Anthony Murphy has uh, discovered, uh, the Henge near Newgrange, and all sorts of other stuff uh, yeah. popping up. Uh, it's a case of one man's pain being another man's pleasure. <laughs> the hot, dry weather, not a good thing for farmers, has given us um, fabulous crop markings um, in, yeah. in the more arid conditions, and they're so much more pronounced. Um, the, the, the rate of discovery of new sites has been extraordinary. Um, yes. um, but the particular ones that have come into focus are the ones near Newgrange. Um, uh, mostly thanks to Anthony, Anthony Murphy. It is astonishing that these markings have never been apparent before. And, and of course, the other um, element in all this, of course, is the ubiquity of drones all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was Anthony Murphy who, you know, who runs the Mythical Island uh, website. He's an author. He also has made a couple of uh, films, actually. Um, I've seen on on YouTube, but anyway, he discovered um, you know this one major uh, new uh, site that is being described as a henge. Uh, we should talk more about that later. Everything mm. seems to be described as a henge nowadays. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, um, it's uh, sparked a whole flurry of attention, and um, there's too much to go into detail here. Um, and and loads of other sites have been found close by too. And, and it's not just in Ireland, of course. Um, we're talking about Wales as well. Um, uh, Large-looking sites in the Vale of Glamorgan, others in the south, in South Gwynedd, um, in the Lynn Peninsula. It's just all over. We the place. sound as if we're in a permanent state of excitement, <laughs> but that's exciting. Yes, yes. I'm glad you didn't say a permanent <laughs> state of arousal, Rupert. But, <laughs> but, but it, yeah. I, it's it's all come at once this uh, this last month, hasn't it? Because you you've got the the combination of the uh, the the drought conditions revealing all these uh, markings in the land, and the beginning of the archaeological season, where you've got uh, archaeological digs starting up into the new season. Yeah. Um, you know, ones being re rebooted and other ones starting uh, afresh all over the place. Oh yeah, I mean, of course, we've got the new stuff at New at um, uh, Brinkethley V, for example. Yes, yes, yes. Now that's exciting. We should uh, do a piece on that uh, in the not too distant future. Absolutely, sure. but there's been too much going on really to cover it all in the news here. Yes. But before we leave that, talking of um, uh, Anthony Murphy, um, the good news is that we're going to be interviewing uh, Anthony. Uh, for an upcoming special podcast yeah, we, about uh, his discoveries mm -hmm. and his work and his writings about Newgrange and uh, all the stuff up there uh, in, in in Ireland. Yes, very much yeah. looking forward to that. So, uh, have you got any more news for us, uh, Rupert? Well, in, uh, in 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 the, in, with you know with the danger of we don't want overload, do we? <laughs> I do. Actually, there's a, a an intriguing. And potentially sinister site, actually, in Pomelta. I hope that's the right pronunciation, close enough, Pomelta, in per Germany. Permit, permit. Yes, <laughs> uh, that is brilliant. That site is 
Just it, brilliant. I want to go there now. It's phenomenal, isn't it? I know. Well, the thing is that the discovery of the site is not the news. It's the fact that, yeah. uh, again, wonders of technology that um, uh, that being able to mess around with um, isotopes and DNA and what have you, that just different things have become apparent. Good. But this is rare. This site is rare because it's a henge, and we don't usually find henges outside Britain. There's a few, but yeah. not many. Um, and basically, this is a big site. It's about 120 metres in diameter, which puts it roughly on the same scale as sites like Stanton Drew. Yeah. Uh, so this was clearly an important place. It's huge. Um, and it consists of seven concentric ditches and banks which is intriguing in itself. So it's n- not like at Stanton Drew where you've got concentric rings of timber posts, exactly. Uh, no, interesting, isn't it? You know, it, it's, it's ditches and banks. And it, yeah. if, if all hinges had a similar function, it tosses up yet another possibility. It makes you wonder if the timber posts in places like Stanton Drew were concentric walls in places like Pomelta. You know, are, are they uh, are they serving the same purpose? You know, that you you have a a, a wall of uh, of posts or a wall of earth. Uh, do you see what I mean? Yeah. You know, were they actually um, the same function? Um, uh, well, the other thing about uh, uh, Pomelta is that um, uh, people have of drawn the obvious. Uh, correlation between Stonehenge and mm. the site of Pomelton, which is that what you've got is uh, posts at, with lintels, yes, um, which is what you've got inside uh, the Sarsen stones um, at Stonehenge. Mm. So uh, similarities have to be uh, uh, the, the similarities have to be pointed out, uh, I guess. They do, and in although fact, they look very different, there are very, very strong correlations between them. Strangely enough, but anyway, onward, onward. We said this wasn't the interesting bit about them, and then proceeded <laughs> it's to. Not, it's not. Yeah. It's not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is that bodies, um, sacrificed or murdered bodies of women and children, not a single adult male amongst them. Right. Women and children. And at least one of the teenagers had their hands tied. Um, Now, interestingly, they did find 13 adult male burials at the site, but they're over to the eastern side where the bodies were buried very reverentially with a lot of care, Uh, whereas these uh, women and children, the 10 murder victims, were just chucked very unceremoniously into the ditch, you know. Um, wow. And yeah. so you, you can ask all manner of questions about that. So, you know, the thing is, there's, there's all sorts of conjecture, obviously. Why why just women and children in the pits? Mm. Why mm. only adult males in the dignified burials? You know, there's, there's um. actually, there's a lot of detail about this site, which... Uh, it, you know, right down to what appears to be the final decommissioning of the site as a whole. So it's, um, you know, it seems to be that it uh, that it it existed for however long, uh, you know, yeah. and that they actually made a conscious decision that that was it. It was the end of the site, and uh, and it was decommissioned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's another one that we, we'll put links up for this because there's we we couldn't possibly cover all the details in the news because we'd be here for another couple of hours um but well worth following those links it seem it seems like a really wonderfully complicated and wonderfully enigmatic uh, site doesn't it really it? does um, yeah, yeah. Uh, like i said earlier i was so dying to go over there because this is interesting because the it is a fully restored site a fully reconstructed site yes. on in situ yeah um with all the you know what the the conjecture uh, conjecture of what the wooden posts were yes. inside even been painted yeah. some of them yeah and and carvings on them yeah uh, and it's now open to the public yes I must admit I'd love to know where they got uh, 
a lot of those details from. But I do agree exactly. with you. You know, it's just you would exactly. We, yes, we maybe we should make a trip. We should investigate and um, and bring more detail Indeed. about that. So uh, some yes. uh, the point. Okay. Anyway, have you, so have you have you got a last one for this month, Mike? Oh, oh let's go back to uh, Siberia. Oh, really? Where yes. are we going? Yes. We seem to have had a lot of news from the East, actually, but yeah, what's this one? This just illustrates how sometimes we miss things that have been there to see forever or whatever. There's a whole load of new rock carvings have been found. Well, the carvings themselves aren't new, obviously, or else we wouldn't be talking about them. (laughs) But but, um, the story is, decades ago, the Soviet authorities built a dam across the Yenesi River to generate electricity, and in doing so, a whole wealth of 5,000-year-old rock art was submerged in the resulting reservoir. Here we go again with the heat wave making loads of sites appearing crop markings. The weathers had a huge impact on the water levels right, in the right, Siberian right, right. reservoir. Yeah, some of the old carvings have been exposed again as the water's gone down. Right. So the thing is, because they are visible by boat, when before they were quite some distance from the riverbank, people have been looking at the rock face from a completely uh, new angle and perspective, and a whole right. load of new carvings have been found high and above the others that were originally known from before when the... Uh, um, the oh, reservoir wow. was okay. was um, uh, filled up. So, yeah, uh, visible all along for a full 5,000 years, but uh, never, nobody ever noticed them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, what we've got uh, a beautifully pecked carvings, uh, you know, painstaking work here, pecked carvings of animals, in, including a, a fight between two argali, a kind of mountain sheep. Uh, amongst uh, other uh, animals, all wild, I do believe. The wild sheep, wild horses, wild... Amazing. Whatever. Amazing. I, I think that's true. Uh, and there's a lot of them. You know, it's not just one or two all over this um, exposed uh, rock face. So, fantastic. just goes to show, sometimes we just need to look a bit harder or <laughs> drain a few reservoirs. <laughs> So, the main theme. Well, before we get to the main theme, Michael, tell us about Cornwall. What were you doing in Cornwall? Because that's all oh, wonderful yes. stuff for people to know about. No, well, I was having a splendid time in Cornwall. <laughs> and, uh, as you, well, the weather was great. And uh, Cornwall looks absolutely splendid <laughs> in the sunshine. It really is another country down there. You know, the light is absolutely gorgeous. But anyway, I digress. I took the opportunity while uh, I was down in Cornwall with my wife and, and the dog um, uh, to visit. Uh, a number of sites, seeing as there are so many uh, down there, and it would have been rude not to. But two, <laughs> <or> one, <laughs> two in particular, I want to talk about, and that's um, uh, Rautor on Bodmin Moor yes. and um, uh, Boscawan Un, merely because there was a couple of uh, interesting things turned up about them that I didn't know before. Uh-huh. So, Rautor to begin with. Now, do you remember back in 2006? I um, have very um, fond uh, A blazing of hot day. Yes. yes. Um, and we were going up and down the hillside, and we were up there on, on the tour itself uh, and um, taking photographs and, and filming the uh, remains of the Bronze Age settlement there. Um, and illustrating them and saying, you know, what a wonderful ancient uh, <laughs> I remember um, it so very well. Uh, uh, landscape it was and, uh, you know, how we can miss things in the landscape and then moving on. Yeah. Oh, boy, did we miss something in the landscape. <laughs> so backtrack a little bit. Um, before I went to Cornwall, I accidentally came across an old Time Team uh, episode. Right. And lo and behold, there they were, digging in the rain I mean, driving rain. They were getting so wet, um, but they were there. They were excavating on Rautor, and not only in the uh, what's supposed to be the Bronze Age village there. And the purpose there was to establish whether it was they were those uh, sort of hut circles were dwellings, or whether they were pounds or whatever, so simply for animal husbandry. But also, they were examining what's known as the the Rautor. Um, long cairn, mm-hmm. which w- we didn't notice. We didn't know about even when we were no, on, we did uh, not. on Rautor on that day. The Rautor long cairn is a 
a mound that basically stretches for 500 yards across the landscape, sort of leading up the hill and uh, eventually coming round to point at the tor. <sighs> now, it's called a cairn, <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, indeed in, uh, in the Time, Time, Time Team episode itself, they were talking about there may be burials here, but I don't think it's a cairn. It looks far more, and I think they came round to the idea in the programme, it looks far more like a causeway. A right. pathway for people to uh, to to walk up. Now I'll be making. Uh, I've got quite a lot of footage there, and I'll making be making a short film, and it'll be much more apparent in the film what I'm uh, talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but it it, it but it's earlier. No, I'll put that uh, differently. It, it, <clears throat> the the village was assumed to be Bronze Age. It was known to be Bronze Age from an earlier excavation. The cairn, the long cairn, is known to be a Neolithic. Now, fortunately, during this excavation, they found that there was uh, that the the village did go back to Neolithic. So the the, the cairn and the village could have been contemporary. But the well, interesting thing on. about so that you're area, saying that what we went, when we were filming back there for Standing with Stones, so what we yep. were looking at as a Bronze Age settlement, you're saying that's actually now been said uh, that it's been. Push back, which is nearly back, yeah. all of it. Yes. Wow. Yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah. It could be simply because one of those things where a simple shard of uh, pottery, exp you know, said bingo. This isn't. This is earlier. Yeah. Right. Okay. You know, one of one of those things. Yeah. Um, so although that um, area uh, now looks quite uh, barren and open, the point was made in the time team program that at the time it would have been well wooded. That hillside uh, would have been covered in um, <clears throat> oak and uh, 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 other stuff. Right. You know, not a, not a grand growth, not a, not a tall growth, but nevertheless, as other parts of Dartmoor and Bodmin are, um, you know, quite, uh, quite well uh, wooded. So at the bottom of the hill, the tall at the top would not necessarily have been visible. So the tantalizing thing from my point of view, that, that, that I, I was thinking, this was, looked like a pathway that would have led through woods and then curved round at its end, po probably at the tree line, to reveal this extraordinary rock formation on the top of the, the tour. That is my theory, and that is my theory alone. <laughs> I'm to it. Okay, well, but it, my 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 little interpretation. Well, look forward but it's, to but it's that a pathway. Film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it, it it is infill, uh, rubble infill between two vertical um, uh, stones placed vertically to contain the infill, and then rubble on the outside to support the vertical. Um, oh wow! Okay, uh, stones. Okay, so it's yeah. quite a complex and that, structure, and that's go, that that goes right for five hundred yards. That's amazing. Up that okay. Hillside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So apart so from Rautel, that. go on. Uh, um, Boscoan Un. Yes. Um, Boscoan Un, we know as a gorgeous and lovely site, fantastic place to to visit. It has uh, atmosphere pouring out of it, like uh, you know. Yes, this is a wonderful place. place. That's true. Uh, and well known for um, the uh, leaning stone right in the middle and the single quartz stone among the 19 surrounding mm. uh, stone. So it's a, it's a lovely, it's a beautiful site. It has been known for some time at the base of the leaning stone in the middle. There are a couple of um, carvings which have been interpreted as uh, the carvings of axe heads. Mm -hmm. Now, the site is dated to the Bronze Age. Now, I'm not sure you know, uh, how that dating has been uh, done uh, exactly, but I think most of the stone circles um, around Cornwall are reckoned to be uh, Bronze Age. But the interesting thing is uh, uh, if, you, if you find these carvings, they're not easily easy to see. Once you know they're there, you you can find them. They're, they're in in relief. They're raised from the stone. They're right at the base of the underside of the leaning stone. Hold on, they're and raised they're, from the stone. Oh yes, yes. And not they're not um, they're not carvings into the stone. They're in relief. Okay. Oh my goodness. So uh, ah yeah. 
oh, okay. So is the suggestion that they cut the whole of the rest of it away? Or yes. that they were, oh, that it was just a, a raised bump on the surface that they cut away to leave? Oh, no, it's a, it's a deliberate uh, shapes that are it, m m caused well, to be in thing. relief okay. from the stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so they have been assumed to be a pair of representations of axe heads. Now, the interesting thing is if Boscanon is Bronze Age, then you'd expect any axe heads to look like bronze axe heads, which have a pronounced fanning towards the blade. Yes. Yes, yeah, so have a narrowish stem uh, and then a, a, a fan shaped towards the blade that because you can mold metal, you can make it lighter by having less uh, metal in, in the body of the, uh, uh, of, of the axe, of the axe head. Yes. But these, if they're axe heads, they look like stone axes, which are full, you know, and, and slightly tapered, just very slightly tapered, one end to an other. I yeah. see what you're saying. Okay. Now, enter an archaeolog archaeologist called Tom Gosker. Uh, who specialises in 3D uh, work with uh, ancient sites and particularly photogrammetry. In 2015, he was right. taken there by another uh, archaeologist and he did a, um, some photogrammetry on this, this, the, the relief, uh, uh, these carvings at the, at the base. Uh, photogrammetry is essentially it's the taking of more than one image so you get a a more precise detail about the uh, really, uh, the the phase difference between the photographs gives you a, a lot a lot of detail much more detail yeah. than you can by okay. <laughs> looking at it so um to cut to the chase of this result of his photogrammetry was that no these weren't axe heads these are the carvings of the soles of feet right because What's revealed in the photogrammetry are five toes <laughs> at the top. Are you joking? It, no, no, not at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, the place to go is uh, uh, Tom Goska's uh, own website. You'll find it in his blog um, if you do a search on Google. But I was actually, uh, and uh, again, I've made a film about this. You'll see me actually underneath the stone. Um, the leaning stone at Boscoanon with my hands on these raised things, and I can actually feel I can run my fingers around where the 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 toes the end of the ends of the feet and the toes are now the thing about this is that it relates to the only other known instance of this occurring is in Brittany at one other place where you've got the soles of feet definitely soles of feet represented um on a um, Neolithic this time, I think. It's a stone that's been destroyed because it only it only exists in, in a photograph, in a known photograph, but it has, but it is absolutely plain to see. But the interesting thing about this was that this was on the inside of a tomb. It was, it was the dress side um, of a stone um, that would be, would have made up the interior of a tomb. So the, right. the tantalizing thing is, did the stones, which actually are at Boscoanon, are dressed on one side, did the stones of Boscoanon originally come from an earlier monument that may have been a tomb and they were repurposed? Well, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because we do know that there are many, many, many sites where, uh, where stones have been reused from Earlier sites that you know long since forgotten, but I mean yeah. even at Newgrange, in fact, where they, it was when they were um, restoring it that they found that um, that half of the stones along the passageway that on the back side, so the the face of the stones that's that's hidden, you know, that's yeah. into the soil, yeah. actually had carvings and engravings yeah. on. So. That's that's a very interesting. One. Yeah. So I hope I've given you enough uh, detail there. But of course, it raises the interesting question of uh, how much influence there was coming across the channel from uh, yeah. uh, the Breton side. Yeah, it is interesting. I do have to wonder if f uh, feet carved into that leaning stone is that the position where you have to put your feet to stop the stone from falling over altogether. 
Um, if you wanted the, if, if the stone was going to fall on you and you wanted to be crushed by it, yes, that's where you would be lying <laughs> or something. I mean, we could, you know, we could go into all sorts of sexual, um, things uh, about it. You know, it's quite powerful. Oh yes. To talking of which, there aren't just the feet, uh, above about two feet above where the, uh, two feet above where the, um, feet are are two um well what shall, what shall i say breasts no in relief absolutely i mean they're, they're quite quite small you know but raised bumps definitely oh right so is the inf the inference is then that what they they think that this stone represented the female form is that the, is that the implication? In, in some in some way on that underside of that leaning stone you've got two feet at the bottom and you've got uh, two raised bump presumably uh, representing breasts about halfway up. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. They're not knees. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, well, it's it just could a be. suggestion. <laughs> do, you, do you have a thing about knees? <laughs> Uh, I think we should move on, um, yeah, but move I, on. I hope uh, that's enough detail, uh, you know, to get uh, you no, that's uh, great. I interested. Think, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, a number of us were seeing some wonderful things that you were putting up uh, as uh, as you were filming, but there's some wonderful stuff to be coming out from all of this. I yeah. know. Watch yeah. this space, folks. Okay. It's going to be good. Yeah. In in the next <laughs> uh, next few weeks, it'll be good. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, shall we uh, move on to the business of the day? The okay. business of the day, which is assumptions and presumptions, and the fact that we just do like to keep repeating old errors. Yes, main theme, assumptions and presumptions, and the fact that we just keep repeating, well, sometimes we just keep repeating stuff that is just plain wrong really and th for the two of us i have to say this is something that it, it kicks off from when we were actually filming standing with stones that we spent so much time researching and writing and researching and writing and we knew exactly what we were going to do when we got to a site i, I was going to say we, we put a lot of faith in the voice of authority as well you know. <laughs> we absolutely did and yeah. then what happened on so many occasions, because, you know, you can imagine we, we put, I mean, we filmed at a lot more sites than actually went into the final film. But, mm. um, but you know, there were a number of sites that we had both visited uh, individually before. But, um, but the majority of the sites we hadn't visited before. So we were trusting all the experts and what we had read in books. And we would arrive at a site and it would just be, well, no. Regroup, rewrite. You know, it's just clearly yeah. what was just perceived wisdom just didn't make any sense at all. And when you start looking into it, you find that, well, actually, that particular bit was written in, say, 1860, and nobody yeah. had ever corrected it since then. It was just perpetuated. So, for example, uh, you know, it's relevant because you were just talking about uh, Cornwall and going yeah. to Boscawanun. Well, the amount of stuff that has been said about Boscawanun, hmm. about the, uh, the, uh, the the leaning stone, um, that people have always assumed that that stone was put in place deliberately leaning. Yes. And the amount of things that you hear about, it leans in a direction, so it's pointing at, where was it supposed to be pointing well, towards? Men and Tull. It's it Men and Tull? So Look on the map. Yeah. Utter tosh. Yeah. It's like 90 degrees completely wrong. You know, it's just, it, it, it doesn't. Um, and, and obviously, it's only if you pull maps out and start to investigate things that you see that, well, this is a myth that whoever said that? Mm. People just made it up. Yeah. Um, and also, the excavations at Bozkarwanon were done back in the 1860s. Yeah. And when you think about it, all the technology that we take for granted today, you know, and, and not, not just the technology, but our rigour, hmm. you know, excavations are done with such care today 
and they never were. Mm. You know, historically, they never were. In fact, a lot of the time, they were just downright sloppy. Uh, you know, essentially amateur archaeologists, really, who were doing their best. Um, and 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 yet, what they assumed and what they gleaned from a site is still what gets written today. Um, yeah, it's it's alarming. If you go back to the very earliest reference. Um, of Boz Carwinon was a chap called William Camden, uh, an antiquarian. Uh, he and he recorded the site in 1597. Yeah. Uh, so you know that is a long time, uh, sufficiently long time before people like Stukeley, who really put everything else on the map. Yeah. Well, Camden said in 1597 he recorded Boz Carwinon as a stone circle with a central stone. He never mentioned that the central stone leaned. Yeah, and you'd have to. Didn't say it? a word about you'd it. You'd have to. It is now, the, you would. It is the you know it, distinguishing thing about the, absolutely. The, it's the it's the one thing that hits you slap in the face when you when you get to the site. Uh, so I'm quite sure that in the in the time between Camden recording the site and Stukeley recording the site um, or Borlase. Um, that uh, something must have happened, whether it was people trying to have a look under the stone and see if there was treasure under there, because we know that people did stupid things like that, yeah. um, or whether it was just something geological happened and it slipped. We don't know. But I'm pretty sure that if it had been leaning in 1597, Camden would have said so. Yeah. It's a, it's an, that's an assumption uh, born of simple observation. But what about w how we get informed by people's attitude um, and the lens that they look at stuff through? And I, I think the interesting thing is, of course, that we forget that it's only relatively recently that we have a concept, that we've developed a concept of the past that extends anything, you know, any, any, for any time at all, um, you know this. This was the uh, thing that uh, antiquaries uh, grasped hold of at the time uh, of Stukeley. They actually started, actually, people actually started looking backwards in time, you know, and and, and realizing that these uh, monuments around. Um, could be indicators of, um, <laughs> uh, you know, another time, another existence. Yeah. Even back then when people were thinking in religious terms, because most people were were heavily religious back in those days, and and so, you know, the Bible tells you that, or, or you, uh, you, it is inferred from your biblical teachings that the world is 5,000 years old or whatever ridiculous age it was supposed to be. And people never extended far uh, beyond that. You know, it, it's only a lot more recently that we've had a, a real grasp of the past. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that, that in itself is, uh, as, as you say, you know, it's an interesting point. The, the, the thing that irritates me, <laughs> as everybody's probably aware, <laughs> the, the, no. the thing that irritates me most about the presumptions is yes, Mr. Grumpy? every time something is found, it's another temple. Yes. And, um, and I know that I'm constantly giving the impression that I am anti <laughs> All these esoteric concepts. I'm not. I'm vehemently anti the presumption. You know, you find something and say it's a temple. It's yeah. tosh. Yeah. You know, it may have been a temple, but why is that always the first assumption? Isn't it a, a trap, though, that we all fall into uh, to a certain degree? Uh, it is that we have a, a shorthand in the way that we perceive things, not only you know in terms of uh, our ancient sites, but in our everyday lives, um, how we make assumptions um, on a day-to-day -day basis based on our past mm. experience, based on what we've been told, based on this, that, and the other. And unless you're going to do the yeah. investigation yourself, and as long as the uh, assumption doesn't get you into trouble then there's no reason really to dispense with it. Um, 
But, you know, we all like a story and that's our instinct to, to make a story around stuff, uh, to, yeah. to, to, to give it legs to, um, and it's something we do automatically. We don't realize how much we do it every day, day in, day out, give things meaning, yeah. which isn't necessarily there. We don't deal with, you know, what's simply there in front of us. We have to make a story about it. And William Stukeley was the, um, uh, you know, <laughs> say what you like about him and thank you, thank you, Mr. Stukeley, for all your <laughs> investigations and the wonderful drawings that you did. Um, but the way that his, the lens that he was looking through has in, uh, <clears throat> so still informs the way we instinctively appreciate um, stone circles nowadays. Yeah, um, it, it really it's, does. Still it's inform. been such a powerful influence. It's it, it's ridiculous. I, I have to say, I, I have wondered many times if Sadukli had never said that these were druid temples. Yeah. You know, if uh, if he had said these were cattle markets. Yeah. You know, what would our view of stone circles be today yeah. if that had been his take? Yeah. Because he did really influence our concepts more than anybody else. If you're the only person person having an opinion, if you're a, the only person uh, yeah. writing a, an opinion down and disseminating disseminating an opinion, then uh, it's it, it's going to stick. I mean, his, uh, his yeah. stuff yeah. did have quite a wide circulation. Um, at the time, yeah. I believe. But the thing is, he himself was a bit obsessive about druids. Didn't he convert? <laughs> didn't he uh, anoint himself um, arch druid? Arch druid. What's psychorax? I can't, can't remember, remember what he called himself. His yeah, actual name. It, it was something utterly preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Kindernax. Kindernax, yeah, wasn't it? Arch druid Kindernax. That sounds about yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. It's a long time since I've said the word because I shudder every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's right. But, you know, that was very yeah. strong with him. So, you know, he, yes. he, he latched onto that idea and, and, and wouldn't let go, basically. And we have not yeah. really let go yeah. since. Well, do you know, uh, it, it's an interesting thing here. That, so we take Stokely and his obsession that all these things were druid temples. But we still, to this day, have this attitude about burial sites. And it's amazing how many places that we, we say they're burial sites and no human remains have ever been found there. Why are we calling that a burial site? Have you got an example, um, Rupert? From stuff that we've been doing uh, recently... Uh, just <laughs> because we were making fools of ourselves at West Kennet, <laughs> it seems relevant. Seems relevant to talk about uh, the uh, the Avebury, you know, the, the Wiltshire complex. Yeah. Well, there are uh, there are two um, uh, long barrows near Avebury. Uh, there's one at Beckhampton Road, and there's one at South Street. There is a website that deals with all the archaeology around Avebury. And there are two particular long barrows, and they are long barrows. Uh, so as I said, there's Beckhampton Road and South Street and never found any human remains in those at all. Um, now, the thing is that uh, you can argue perfectly reasonably mm. that, you know, from an awful lot of other evidence we have, well, that a long barrow is clearly a burial site. Well, yeah, okay. So you then have to ask the question then, well, why have you got burial sites? Why have you got long barrows that don't have any burials in them? Mm. And there might be a number of reasons for that. You might have, well, maybe they'd built these places and just they never got round to burying anybody there because they didn't fill the others up. Did they have an, a, an amount of people that would uh, <laughs> that would be allowed to be buried in a place before moving on? Or maybe, uh, and this is something I did wonder, even now we have, for example, war memorials and some war memorials have burials associated with them. And some don't. But the vast yeah. majority do not. Yeah. Um, you know, now it does seem that a long barrow is a bit lavish in terms of a, 
a, a symbolic burial site. Because they take a lot, they, they take a lot of effort to make a long be. barrow. Yeah. Um, but then equally, you know, we take it for granted because other people are doing the work and we have machinery now. But you go back to a war memorial from, say, the First World War, where that limestone, uh, you know, whether it's a cross or, you know, whatever sort of uh, monument it is, that limestone was all cut by hand. Yeah. That's a huge amount of work. Here's the thing. Um, Here's the thing. Um, um, just for example, because we happen to be uh, mentioning it, um, Pumota. Um we have two instances of burials there, as I said before. But this is another site that has been in use over a very long period of time. And what you've yeah. got rep represented there are snapshots, little tiny moments in time. These burials represent tiny moments in time. Yes. And they will have made perfect sense to the human beings that were there at that time in that moment. But they don't ne mm. ne the, but neither event necessarily re represents the culture of the people that were uh, using that site. The, we'll take the example of the the what seems to have been uh, a murder. Uh, of these uh, teenagers and the women, um, what, what seems to have uh, been a brutal uh, assault. That happened on one day, uh, in one moment in time. Yeah. And if we know anything about human beings, you know, they can go for long periods of time, have long periods of stability, and then shit happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it comes out of the blue and it's nothing yeah. to do with how they are you know perfectly reasonable day-to-day -day people can suddenly do very strange things because strange yeah. things happen and on that one day you uh, 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 you know this stuff happens people go mad do this one thing um and four or five thousand years later some people dig this up and then paint you with this um, uh, event, as if this event might, may have been representative of the people that you were. I think that's that a, a very good point, actually. Uh, and, uh, and you can take an extension of that from a cultural point of view that, you know, uh, as you said, that, you know, you have a site that, I mean, maybe, for example, when we look at sites that we know about, that when it was built, if a site has been in use for over a thousand years, and you know most of our churches, for God's sake, you know, they, I mean, they've been in use for a thousand years, getting on, mm. uh, and some of them more. Well, that's a long time, and and yet, you know, we know of prehistoric sites that were in use for a hell of a lot longer than a thousand years. So, it you could have a site that it was built with this particular function in mind. But, you know, as Brinkethley Lee is a perfect example. Absolutely. On Anglesey, that you have something that we know that its function changed at least three times yeah. during its development. And it's for me, it's analogous to the amount of churches. Um, I used to live in Teddington, and there is a beautiful church in Teddington that it was almost at the beginning of the 20th century it was almost going to be a cathedral the city of Teddington never happened um, it's a massive church and that church is now apartments the, 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 <laughs> yes. the exterior of the church is is still well not not a hundred percent but the exterior of the church is is still very much a church but inside yeah. it's apartments. Um, and uh, you know, so and, as how, so how many does... churches and chapels are, they're Absolutely. residential now uh, in and villages I think that, up and down the you country. Know, that's very relevant to to what we're saying here. That you know, if if archaeologists of uh, of the future were digging up one of those churches, for example, then what would the inference be? You know, would, would be would they be interpreting it as living space, or would be, they be interpreting it as religious space you mm. can say with 100 percent certainty they would be saying that it was religious space <laughs> but in that instance i suppose that's fair <laughs> yeah um but you know but there's the point you know you you can't make assumptions about uh, uh, about those sorts of cultural influences because they do change so much
So we're not saying, um, you know, chuck out uh, it, them being temples. We're not saying chuck out them no. being places of, of ritual. It's it's just to be aware of of our tendency to uh, pigeonhole, to make a story that fits, that we enjoy, and yes. that we like. But that isn't necessarily the truth. No, and we do love to uh, to to feign certainty, don't we? We know what this was. No, we don't. If we're in search of the truth, that's what we have to keep, keep reminding ourselves of. Yes. What are what are my assumptions here? I mean, mm. I, to a certain extent, I observe it in myself, having um, come to you know certain conclusions. I don't know you, you, you the same. We have an attitude about uh, mm. some sites, about them being for blood sports, perhaps, or a animal yeah. husbandry, and mm. because we want you know to round that out, we want to. Uh, ground it. We want to find evidence, you know, that will support that. We tend to look through that lens sometimes. We have, sometimes you have to say, no, stop. Mm. You might be actually wrong there. Look yeah. at it from the other f side and come round. And then if it still works, it works. Carry forward. Mm. Yeah. Um, That's very but, true. But, I, I, th I do think that one of the things we really have uh, working for us now, something that we've never had historically, is the phenomenal development of technology in recent years yeah. that uh, is allowing us to, uh, you know, whether it's carbon dating or, uh, you know, all the strontium isotope readings, you know, the fact that we can actually take something and measure it and categorically say with, with 90 whatever percent certainty yeah. that, you know, that we can give it a date or we can, you know, uh, we can look at, teeth and say where they came from, what have you. That's completely changing the way uh, archaeology is being interpreted. Yeah. You know, um, but isn't, isn't it the ironic thing, Rupert, that going, if we dare, let's go back to Aubrey Hole 7. Oh, <laughs> okay. I know exactly where you're going. Yeah, go on. Yeah, because you're so yeah, right. You're so which, right. Which, again, has been in the news recently. And we mm. could have put it up front here. We could have put it in, in the news. But we've already covered it. So, you know, yeah. and this is the, uh, the study of the remains that were buried in Aubrey Hole 7 and the results of that from the strontium 90 isotope has given us um, some suggestions as to where some of the people that were buried at Stonehenge may have come from. They may yeah. have come from North Devon. They may have come from South Wales. And all mm. of a sudden, we get the headlines, the Welsh built Stonehenge. Yes, it's painful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And how long will that persist now, you know, amongst people who have read those headlines mm. alongside pictures of the sarsen stones and the lintels, yeah. nothing to do with the fact that if they did bring stones, you know, if, they, they, if, if uh, those people were from Wales that put the blue stones there, that we're not talking about the sarsen stones, we're talking about a much, much earlier thing entirely. And people read that. And accept that as being accurate, and it just isn't. Um, mm. You know, and, and the thing is that there there are certain things that uh, you know the assumptions people make. So okay, we know that the blue stones came from Wales, but when people go to Stonehenge, what people recognise and think of when you say Stonehenge is nothing to do with the stones that came from Wales. They're talking about, yeah. as you say, the um, you know the the lintels and the sarsens, and that's not what came from Wales. At the same time as our ranting here, we've got to acknowledge that also it's a reasonable hypothesis that people from Wales, given the evidence that we have. It is a reasonable hypothesis, um, it, it, given, knowing what we do about the Priscelli stones, uh, the blue stones that, that, they, that they came from uh, Priscelli. So you, you've just got to keep those balances in, in your mind. And, and yes. if you choose a side to come down on, realise that uh, you can't know with any certainty. You can just argue from a point of view with yeah. respect, you know, and unless people that talk, other people are talking absolute dross in terms of their facts, 
You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Yes, yes, that's a good distinction. Um, you know, then all's fair in, in love and war. And look, the thing is, we don't want to be hard nailed about this. Hard, <laughs> we don't want to come in with hobnail boots about this <laughs> because part of the thing that keeps drawing us back to the stones is the romanticism of them. In particular, I was thinking about the Rollwright Stones uh, the other day and the story associated with the Rollwright Stones of the king coming along the path there and meeting the witch that uh, tells him if he takes uh, enough strides from where he's standing and he can see Long Compton in the valley below, king of England he will become. Now, the thing is, he met a witch. And I don't know what it is about the Roll Right Stones, you know. It uh, it it just speaks of witchery and witchcraft. You know, there's something about it in its environment now. The way the the stones lean over, they, they, it's like they belong on a blasted heath. <laughs> uh, you 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 expect to see a cauldron bubbling in the middle of the, and and you can't take away what pops up in our imagination. It does inspire our imaginations, and that's the delight that we take in them, whether it's a fantasy or whether we're using our imagination to get at some kind of truth, which mm. might be like looking for a black cat in a coal cellar at night at times, but we do it anyway. Let me we just finish off with this. We came, we, we came up with a wonderful analogy for this problem of uh, establishing truth from the evidence that we have from ancient <laughs> sites. And that is, do you remember there was a, the, 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 back in the 70s or something like that, um, lateral thinking questions were <laughs> quite a rage uh, for a bit. And the classic one was, a man comes across two lumps of coal and a carrot in a together in a field. Yes. What? Does he know from that? Yes. And if you think about it, if you're bright, you think there was a snowman here and it's melted. Yeah. But archaeology and discerning truth from what we know about our ancient sites is more like coming across a carrot in a field minus the two lumps of coal. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. There's no triangulation going on here. There's no other... A bit of evidence that cross references the fact that we've got a carrot. We can yeah. make up any a number of things from having a carrot in the middle of a field. Just give us the lumps of coal and we'll, you know, get close to something. But the <laughs> carrot on its own, you know, it pays your money, it <laughs> makes your choice. It's too true. Which uh, brings us to uh, question time. Rupert, have we got a question? So, yeah, we do. We do. We have a question from Anne Foster in Barnstable. Uh, in fact, Anne, she's not the first person to ask this question, but she gets the credit for it all the same. Uh, and she said, hi, guys, love the podcasts. Tell me, do we know if all dolmens really were covered by earth mounds? And uh, and uh, yes, we do know, uh, and we know that they weren't. <laughs> the vast majority of of dolmens were covered completely with mounds of earth, but right. there are oh, some some were and some weren't. There were a very yes. few that weren't completely were, covered yeah. by okay. earth mounds. And that just kind of leaves a question hanging because we don't know why. And all I can say from a personal point of view is that take sites like, if any of you know, we'll put links up, um, if any of you know places like Trethevi Quoit in Cornwall, well, Trethevi Quoit is, man, that's an impressive dolmen. It's a phenomenally impressive dolmen. Mm. And I can't help thinking, because this is one of the ones that wasn't completely covered in an earth mound, and I can't help thinking that if a community has got together 
and constructed something with a capstone that impressive and that deliberately angled, because it does, the capstone slopes at such an impressive angle. And you can tell that there's no accident because the walls are very much constructed to support it in that, uh, in that angle. That if you've gone to the trouble to do something so brilliant from an engineering point of view, why are you going to hide it? Yeah, you brought up a question for me because I was listening to you and I was realising in my own mind that really I don't know much about dolmens, cromlechs and, and quoits at all. Um, uh, how much <laughs> we know about them archaeologically, you know, whether uh, burials, yes. Um, mm. There were closed burials, yes, but, but I don't, don't know for sure. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> there was a kind of assumption in my mind. <laughs> but the, isn't uh, that the thing, though? That uh, yeah. you know, we we've got to this this odd place in in archaeology where because we have such amazing technology at our disposal now. We're looking for things that are far deeper than the, if you like, the external surface views mm -hmm. of things. So people aren't looking at, at the details like, well, was that covered or not? They're looking at, can we date the uh, the organic remains that we found underneath? Can we, you yeah. know? Um, so the, the the emphasis has changed, and in many ways, I think that actually we should go back a hundred years, you know or go back at the assumptions of the last 150 years and completely reanalyze what we think we know, because I think yeah. it'll change an awful lot of our perceived wisdom. Well, you know what? Hopefully, you know, um, we can um, be a part of that, Rupert. I don't know. You know, we intend to cover quite a lot of area yeah. with all the stuff that we're doing, and hopefully we can um, uh, bring a few threads together in that regard. It would um, be nice. Synthesize a yeah. few, um, yeah. you know, known facts in, into something. Yeah, uh, no, it I, would I be hope good. so. It with the help of our, without, with the help of our Patreon supporters, of course. Indeed, <clears throat> indeed, we love our Patreon supporters. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Anne, there you are. I, um, I that's that's not a, a concrete answer one way or the other. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe it is. Ninety something percent of them were covered, and a few of them weren't. But we don't know why. Um, so, uh, yeah, there you go. I, I hope that gives you some answer anyway. Well, do you know what? Now it can only be time for Stonehead of the Month. Stonehead of the Month. Stonehead of the Month. Michael, who is Stonehead of the Month this month? Well, there's really only one way to go with this, and Stonehead of the Month this month um, goes to Anthony Murphy. Oh, quite right too. The thing is, he's not just Stonehead of the Month. Anthony Murphy has been uh, studying stuff in uh, Northern Ireland and particularly around Newgrange forever and a day. He runs the website and blog called uh, Mythical Island. Uh, check it out. Um, but the point is that this is one guy, you know, who uh, is an a bit more than your average stonehead of the month. Uh, he's... Uh, you know, he's been a stonehead for, for years and years and years and years and years and has always been a supporter of ours, I have to say. And now he's gone and proven that old adage that if you work hard enough at something, then you create your own luck. And this, uh, for him, it's manifest in uh, finding his very own brand new henge. There's an oxymoron. <laughs> so uh, big hats off to Anthony and we'll look... We're looking forward uh, in the uh, next few days of actually speaking words with him and uh, producing a nice uh, uh, special podcast with him to mull over all the implications and discoveries that he has made um, over the past um, uh, weeks or so. Rupert, this is, um, as usual, our regular final slot of the podcast, <laughs> finishing up with something a little bit light-hearted, but at the I think this is seriously light-hearted. This is seriously light-hearted. 
It's, it's lightheartedly it serious, isn't it? It is lightheartedly serious. That, in fact, that's the better way of putting it. Yes. Mm. Um, the, a number of <laughs> this is from a personal thing for me. Okay, it was an experience I had uh, a, some years ago, and uh, the, the reason it came up again now is because uh, many of you might be aware of uh, there's. Forbidden Archaeology. It's a book by what's God, Michael? What's the guy's name? Michael Cremo. That's the man. And um, now there's all sorts of stuff that you can find, uh, and it's kind of conspiracy theory stuff where people show you all these wonderful things and say this is perfectly unexplainable. Um, and one of the things that I saw for the hundredth time, but it just flagged up for me, was this hammer that had been discovered in stone. So it must have been millions of years old, dating from, you know, way back, long before humans were supposed to be there. But there was this hammer locked in stone. And a lot of the websites that this appears on tells you that it's in sandstone. But any geologist looking at the photographs can see straight away that it's actually in ironstone. And (laughs) ironstone... Yeah, well, duh. uh, Yeah, duh. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but iron stone, if you know how it's formed, basically iron precipitates out of rock. So iron, you know, it comes out as an orangey liquid in the rocks. And that as it dries, that will harden and it will become a, a very iron rich rock. And so the fact that a hammer from pff, 100 years ago, a couple of hundred years ago, could have been locked into this apparent piece of ancient rock is nothing mysterious. Well, why did this flag up for me? I'll tell you why. It's because I was walking along the coast in Devon, along the Jurassic Coast, and the Jurassic Coast, a long stretch of the Jurassic Coast, is marl. It's green marl. Uh, Now, (laughs) green marl is is it basically it's nearly limestone but there's not enough lime in it to make it limestone so marl is basically limestone with not a lot of lime and because there's not enough lime in it to make it go rock solid it just oozes and i was walking along uh, the beach uh, along the jurassic coast and <laughs> and i saw uh, there had been an awful lot of rainfall and the the marl itself was it's kind of a clay like consistency harder than clay but like a gritty clay was oozing out of the hillside and was engulfing somebody's discarded black plastic rubbish bag so this this bag was just being consumed <laughs> by what will be rock. It's just a matter of time before the marl dries out and it becomes apparently a limestone with a plastic bag inside it. And it's exactly the same <laughs> as the hammer in the ironstone. And it was just, there it was, uh, the fossilization, if you like, in or, or forbidden archaeology in action, a rubbish bag basically being consumed in what will be a kind of limestone. And I will post the photographs that I took of my plastic bag. Not my plastic bag. I didn't discard the plastic bag. Um, but uh, I ju- it just, uh, I stood on the beach and I laughed because I was reminded of this nonsense, however many millions of years old hammer, not. Um, and just thought, there you are, I can give evidence for how these sorts of things can be misunderstood. It made me laugh. It is whimsy. There you are. I have done my bit. Uh, uh, What a brilliant bit of whimsy that is. (laughs) Thank you so (laughs) much. And, folks, with that... Um, that is uh, that is it for the, this podcast. Yes, they were. It just the remains for us to uh, say thank you uh, to you for uh, listening, and of course that if you have enjoyed the podcast, please do uh, consider becoming a patron of ours uh, at the uh, Patreon site, where for as uh, little as a dollar a month, uh, you can... Packet of crisps, packet of crisps. Packet of, <laughs> price of a packet <laughs> of crisps. Um, <laughs> uh, you can help ensure that uh, we continue to um, 
produce the podcast and uh, also all the other stuff that we're um, putting out at the moment, films, videos, interviews, mm. uh, you name it, all um, megalithic. We really do appreciate your support. And, uh, and, and, and don't forget to share it with your friends. You know, if you've enjoyed it, share it with your friends because the, uh, the wider audience we get, uh, you know, the more support we get along the way. It's all great. So thank you very much. Brilliant. So that's it. Until the next time, it's uh, goodbye from me. <laughs> and it's goodbye from him. <laughs> oh, dear. Thank you, folks. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.